Good morning, good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesday program. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar entitled Pavement Response to Super Heavy Load Movement. Next slide, please. I'd like to first review a, a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, if you're having an issue with your sound and you're using your computer speakers, please dial in using your phone. If you're having an, a different type of issue, please use the chat button to send a message and only please send that message to the host. Next slide, please. To ask a question, and certainly throughout the entire program, we encourage you to ask questions. We will have a dedicated question and answer period at the conclusion of the technical presentation. To ask your questions, send your question to both the host and the panelists, and we'll address these as I indicated at the conclusion of the program. Next slide, please. To view the presentation in full screen, at the top of your webinar settings, click on the down arrow, highlight view, and then select fit to viewer. Next slide, please. Now it's my pleasure to introduce and give you a bit of background on today's presenter, a brief bio on Sheila Hala. She is a pavement engineer with over 12 years experience and serves as a pavement project engineer for a variety of asset management and um, pavement projects for several pavement, highway pavement, and airport pavement evaluation of design assignments. Her experience includes pavement condition assessments, rolling weight deflectometer testing, MIT scanning, ground penetrating radar, friction, pavement designs, and life, tech, life cycle cost assessments for both roadways and highways. She's experienced with the design of new roadways, including rigid, flexible, and composite pavements, as well as the rehabilitation of existing roadways in both rural and urban settings. Relevant to today's presentation, Ms. Anal was the lead project engineer on several projects that involved the transport of heavy moves throughout central Alberta and Canada. Prior to joining ARA, she completed a Master's of Applied Science degree at the University of Waterloo. And now, Sheila, please. Thank you, Gary. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, the title of today's webinar is Pavement Response to Super Heavy Load Movement. And we will talk about the impact on the pavement due to heavy load movement. Um, at this time, I would like to also acknowledge Alex Tigel. He is a computational research engineer for ARA, and we work together on this project for the last five years, and this project is, um, as much as I spent time on it, he spent equal amount of time, and thank you, Alex, for that. And a lot of your questions, which might come in, um, you know, Alex might be answering that in, in the later time. Um, I will first start my presentation with the outline. So here's the outline of my presentation. Um, I will start with a brief introduction, and then, um, you know, talk about consequences of moving moving heavy loads. We will go through some of the findings of literature review. Uh, we will discuss a little bit about background of the project, and then um, talk about finite element analysis uh, methodology that we use, the results, and then how we tie the finite element analysis results into pavement damage. At the end of the presentation, I will talk about pre and post move condition inspections um, that we completed for this project, and then we'll finish off with summary and results. In the past um, decade, there has been a shift on the development and expansion of industrial plants in rural areas. Now, all, all, all of us know how fast our technology is advancing, and with this fast-paced advancing technology, um, you know, larger industrial components of um, uh, components 
for these industrial sectors have been prefabricated off-site, and they've been they've, they've been getting shipped to destination plants, and that has resulted in the movement of um, super heavy loads that were not previously designed uh, or that were not previously considered in the design of these roadways here. So this is a challenge, and you know, do we all think that? Um, this pavement right here was designed for this kind of load to move across? Probably not, right? So, sorry, too fast. Um, so, you know, this, this is a challenge, and we've all seen that in the recent years. We've all seen more wind farm moves um, and shale extraction, things like that have been taking our pavement um, for heavy load moves more than ever. Now, moving those heavy loads on these pavement have consequences. Um, depending upon the condition of the roadway, um, the, the roadway might sustain premature pavement damage. In some cases, it could have pavement failures, and in some, and eventually, they they eventually mean that that's a reduced level of service. And certain types of construction projects, for example, like I said earlier, wind farm moves, um, sail extraction involve repeated overweight loads for the construction period. And for these cases, for both of these cases, um, the loads result in a decrease in life of the pavement. And pavement well, per performance is significantly influenced by the magnitude of frequency and um, frequency of the heavy, heavy vehicle traffic loads. Um, and, you know, and um, and the weight, right? So, um, because of this reason, many agencies in North America have placed limits on truck weights and dimensions. Um, so, moving on to next slide, um, here I'm showing some of the overweight trucks. And as you can see, overweight trucks and super heavy loads can cause disproportionate damage to roadways that are not covered by permitting fees. Having said this, so the limits that agencies have put in on the on the weight, the weight and dimensions, the project, for example, the shale extraction project, has to obtain associated permit for the move. At present, though, the permit for um, the overweight vehicles, they draw fees that come nowhere near the cost of the reduced road life. And using the techniques that we will discuss today in this presentation, the loss of life can be quantified, and the resulting cost can be passed on to those responsible for the loading. For this reason, um, many agencies in North America are beginning to require some form of super heavy load movement analysis in order to ensure that um, they get the permit for the vehicles, you know, with a decent amount of data and facts behind um, this move um, and make sure that, um, you know, they're okay to drive in their pavement. In early 2015, we, um, we were contacted by um, several manufacturers in, in um, Alberta because they had um, planned several moves from 2016 through 2018. And these moves were not just heavy moves; they were super heavy moves, and the loads that were that were that were planned were ranged from 1.4 million pounds to about 3.5 million pounds. Um, and um, the one specifically here you're looking at is a petrochemical vessel. Um, I'm going to um, say it as a splitter in my in my discussion moving forward. The splitter. Um, Fort Petrochemical Plant was going to be moved from Edmonton to Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. As you can see, this vehicle is, this, this load is massive. This load itself is longer than the length of a football field. Now, how do you analyze the impact of such a big monster load on a pavement such as what we saw earlier? Um, by the way, the picture that you saw on my first introduction slide that's the same load, and that's the pavement that we're talking about. Um, now, 
what are the what are the damages that pavement could have? You know, such as is it fatigue, cracking, and rutting? Um, you know, there were some questions, and this, this is the problem that we're um, we're trying to find a solution to. So we moved on to go do some literature reviews and see what they've done out there. Um, we we looked at a bunch of literatures and uh, from the, first of all, there weren't a lot of literatures out there. Um, you know, very few articles, very few study about um, heavy loads that's been done in um, to date. And from the review, we found that um, analysis procedures for super heavy load move were mostly based on layered elastic theory and finite element models to predict the stresses and strains associated with the loading. Um, the, the stresses and strains that, um, that they came up with were then finally related to pavement distresses using transfer functions. Um, the critical distresses that they identified um, include uh, fatigue cracking and pavement rutting. Uh, now, what are the what are the limiting values for fatigue cracking and pavement loading? When is it con considered to be failed? And the, those common failure limiting values were um, that were suggested by these literatures were um, 12.5 millimeter rutting, that is also 0 0.5 inches of rutting, and 10 to 20 percent fatigue cracking of the pavement area. What when is a load considered super heavy? Super heavy loads are the loads that exceed um, gross vehicle weight that is, for in, in this case, for example, this is the definition of Texas DOT. Um, Texas Department of Transportation identifies that once the vehicle exceeds 254,000 um, pounds, then you know, pounds of gross vehicle weight, then that means it's a super heavy load. But there's also more criteria, you know, it has to exceed maximum permissible weight on any axle or axle group, or exceed 200,000 pounds with less than 95 feet of axle spacing. So there are all these criteria that Texas has. And, um, you know, this picture or this graphic on, on my right side of the screen, um, this came from NCHRP Synthesis 476. And this shows different legal loads in different states. And um, this summary, this, this synthesis has summary of state and provincial weight regulations and, you know, very good information there. So if someone's interested, you guys can go refer to that. Um, here, what you can see is um, Texas, Arizona, Pennsylvania, these black states are more than, has more than 200,000 uh, pounds of gross vehicle weight um, permitted in their highways. And then you go down here, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, you know, New York, and so on are 180 to 200 kits. So it moves downward. Um, and that's the legal load for different states. Um, now, all right, we have these legal load limits. We have these super heavy loads. How do we analyze these? Um, these buggers, basically. Um, the, the procedure that we, we found out from literature reviews were layer elastic theory and finite element models. Now let's talk about some of the analysis criteria that, um, that we, uh, we came up with. Um, for pavement, what, what, what is pavement damage? Well, pavement damage is typically assessed in terms of the number of equivalent single axle loads that the, the AC can, asphalt concrete, can withstand until the percentage of cracking in the wheel fat um, reaches a critical level. So I discussed this earlier in, in literature review slides. Uh, the critical level is usually defined as, you uh, we know, we did 10 to 20 percent uh, of cracking along the wheel path and then similar uh, criteria for rutting, which is um, subgrade rutting, which is due to non non recoverable uh, vertical compressive strains. Um, so the critical value for rutting is 12.5 millimeters, 0.5 inches. For this project, we considered um, 
the absolute value of asphalt grain. Um, and this, um, this comes from National Center for Asphalt Technology, NCAT, and they recommended an asphalt strain um, endurance limit of 70 micro strain, um, 70 micro strain. And this, this is, um, it, what it means is um, if there is a strain less than 70 micro strain, that, that would indicate that the asphalt concrete would still be in the elastic range and therefore applied load would not cause any permanent damage to structural loading. Moving on to rutting, the, the passage of the transporter also causes the pavement to deflect vertically downward. What happens when this heavy load moves on a pavement? Everything deflects downward. So, um, and because of this deflection, because of this vertically deflecting downward, which causes stresses and strains on top of the subgrade layer, um, and this is and to avoid the, the rutting, to avoid rutting, it is expected um, based on NCAT and monitor again, is um, the limiting strain is 200 micro strain. Um, so we, we need to make sure that the compressive strains at the top of the subgrade are lower than the design threshold. Um, so we looked at methodologies, different methodologies. One of them was using mechanistic empirical pavement design guide, um, which is afterward pavement ME software, which follows MEPDC. Um, MEPDC pavement ME has a special module that um, is called special traffic loading for flexible pavements. And this module lets, um, lets you select special traffic loading option and um, we we attempted running payment ME software, but ME is not configured for this kind of massive platform trailer. Um, you know, it only handles 16 axles of traffic load and uh, so on and so on. There are other limitations. So uh, we moved on to finite element model. The software that we use uh, for finite element model is LS Dyna software. Um, and LS Dyna software was relevant to us because um, because of its dynamic effects. Um, you know, it's a dynamic finite element software. We wanted the, the, this vehicle to simulate the, the 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 load when it's moving. We don't want to do it static. Um, and um, and we want you know based on the literature review we needed to make sure that we were able to determine the, the maximum strains in the asphalt and subgrade, which was, which was all possible with our Dyna software. Before I jump onto the background of the actual, um, actual um, vehicle and, you know, all that stuff, I, I thought I would put in a slide of um, the article that was published in January, first week of January 2019. Um, so this is the trailer um, actually on the move, on the road. Um, um, and this is a snapshot of an article that was, that was published. And if you are interested on in looking at the videos of the move, then uh, feel free to look for the heaviest load in Alberta. And this was the heaviest load in Alberta's history. So you will find lots and lots of articles. And um, videos and very, very cool, cool, important, uh, fun stuff. Moving on to the background. So the, the gross vehicle weight of, um, of this entire trailer is 3.5 million pounds, 1.5 million kilograms. Um, and there are two platform trailers. So as you can see here, um, this is the first one. Second one, each platform trailer has 26 axles, and each axle has 16 tires in them. Um, so that makes the number of tires to be 832 tires. Uh, weight per tire is 1,679 kilograms or 3,702 pounds. Um, note that I am saying the weight is, is consistent throughout all of these because that's how um, this 
this um, vehicle configuration was designed. Um, I am going to talk about, um, you know, around the end of the presentation after I show the result of this move, just for you to give comparison, get some comparison on other moves. I'm going to talk about only the results of the other move. I'll show you the um, show you the quick picture of the vehicle as well. Um, and in that one, you will note that the tires are completely the tire um, that the weight per tire are not similar in the steering axle and the driving axle. Um, rolling speed of this vehicle, um, this um, this load move would be five kilometers per hour or three miles per hour. Now, this rolling speed is, you know, in the beginning of our iterations. So we did multiple iterations. We did about five iterations of simulation. Um, many scenarios changed. Um, and one of the scenarios that kept on changing was rolling speed because, um, you know, speed is such an important factor in this um, in the simulation. Um, they first said 20 kilometers per hour, and, you know, that's their normal speed when they have no problems at all. And then again, it went down to 15, and it went ultimately down to five kilometers per hour because that was going to be the slowest speed um, that they would travel. And uh, pardon me for my unit uh, of metric system and U.S. customer units. I I work in Canada. I am trying my best to um, also um, um, I'm trying my best to talk to the both audience from. Uh, metric units and U.S. units world. So um, I've got units here in the in the back bracket. So um, that should be okay. Um, and you know, we we the scenario changed many many times. The cross step scenario changed, and vehicle configuration changed, pavement sections changed. Um, we want to model this this load moving, not um, static, like I said before. Um, you know, we want to simulate the real news. Um, so that's 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 why that kept on changing. And you know, we needed to make sure that every iteration was accounting for the real thing that was going to happen in the first week of January 2019. This is um, the route um, of the heavy load. Uh, move 142 kilometers, 88 miles. We started at Dacker Industries in Northwest Edmonton, um, and then we ended our journey in Petrochemical Complex, Fort Saskatchewan. This is a general route map. Uh, more specifically, though, um, around here in the city, before we got into the rural area, um, you know, specific crossovers were built to make the heavy move easier. These these crossovers were part of the master planning during construction in anticipation of these heavy moves in Alberta. Um, so think about it. This load is so tall that it couldn't go under under a bridge. So there were lots of bypasses. Um, and intersections had to be widened just for this move. Um, going to the traffic light, you know, traffic light had to be taken out because it would hit the traffic light. Um, lots and lots of work behind actually um, moving this thing um, to that piece as well. Now that we have the vehicle configuration set, we've got the route. Um, you know, our next um, next next challenge is what is the roadway model um, that we are going to um, analyze our data in, right? Um, because we need we need a section. So. We had it's the 88 miles um, of the route. So think about it. There will be fill section, cut section. Um, there will be side slope that will um, that could influence the reflection profile and um, the pavement structure changes every few hundred meters to every kilometer. Um, so in that um, in that phase, getting a representative pavement section that um, allows us to be confident on, okay, this pavement section represents the entire route is a challenge. And, um, you know, obviously we wouldn't pick the best section and we didn't pick the worst section because the worst section will fail. Um, so this 175 millimeter though um, is the worst section that we did 
on our last iteration because in the first in the beginning we did about 225 millimeter which is the, which was a representative pavement section and then after everything was okay and we everybody was happy all the transportation came back and said no we still need more confidence let's see let's make sure that there is no any catastrophic failure um let's do our analysis one more time with with the least with the thinnest pavement structure out there in the entire route so we went with 175 millimeter of pavement thickness um granular base was um, 225 millimeters um so frozen subgrade here is 1.5 meter from top of the pavement we started the analysis um, our first analysis was the two meter frozen subgrade and then uh, after a few months that winter um, the Alberta Transportation had um, installed these frost probes in the ground um, and then they came up and they said oh the, the uh, frost probes are recording a frost depth of 1.5 meter and not 2 meter anymore. Um, so that was a huge change, right? Because we just lost half a meter of frozen subgrade, which is a big deal in moving these heavy loads. Um, so, you know, we changed the analysis. So that's why we have changed this analysis so many times and there were so many multiple iterations of the analysis. Ultimately, we settled with this four to one slope. Um, this is based on the construction standards for the roadway along the move route. Now that we have the roadway model, we've got the super heavy load vehicle configuration, we've got all of that. Um, next is material properties. Now it's very important to know the in situ condition of the roadway. We obtained FWD test results from other transportation. Um, other transportation does um, do, do, the, do these FWD tests in their pavement um, every two to three years. Um, so it was easier um, to have that, uh, you know, the history of the um, sections um, through the route. And then uh, we, we ran a different simulation to find the subgrade properties of the roadway section. This diagram is, it looks complicated, but all you need to know is what it's showing you is um, the asphalt is viscoelastic material and it changes its properties with load and time of the move. It's very dynamic. Um, if the temperature changes, if the temperature of the move changes, then the property changes. So um, this, 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 this graph itself, dynamic modulus versus frequency was, um, was um, this ARA did the material testing in a lab and this is the result of that graph, but it's a very dynamic graph and it changes based on the properties um, that are available for move. Next um, step in the analysis is coming up with the roadway model. So what you're seeing here is there's a roadway center line and we, you're looking at half of the roadway along the travel direction. So this total um, length of the roadway is 160 meters. That's, that's all we modeled. Um, and this 49 meter is the fine mesh reason. So um, we, we needed to make sure that we build a model that will allow us to model the entire load and 160 meter mesh out of, um, out of 160 meter, this 49 meter is a fine mesh. This length, 49 meter, is a semi-arbitrary length that's long enough to contain the trailer for entire simulation. Now, when I say trailer, it's, we only did simulation for half of the trailer, so just the driving axle or the steering axle. Because if we knew uh, what happened in the front or the back axle, then we could predict what's going to happen on the next axle, right? Because there is enough time that pavement could recover its state back if there is any problem with it. Um, the 56 meter coarse mesh, we're added to make sure that we don't have any serious boundary effect um, during simulation. This is a finer version of the fine mesh, um, mesh reason that I talked about. Um, so what you're seeing here, this is one of the axle lines. 
you're seeing two sets of eight wheels. So we did the we did analysis for the half of the roadway section. That means we did analysis for half of the axles. Um, if you remember from our axle, there are, there were 16 wheels in an axle. So these are only eight wheels, um, and that is the rolling direction. So these wheels they have different tires. These tires. They, they, these are different, um, you know, much different threads in them. The load distribution is different. The elements of um, the tire were modeled. Uh, we contacted a um, trailer manufacturer to give us contact length and contact width for these tires. Um, and these contact length and width, um, they depend upon the load and speed of the vehicle. So we were in frequent contact with the manufacturer based on um, you know, until the vehicle configuration was finalized and until the speed of the vehicle was finalized because we needed to change that every so often. Um, and you're, you're seeing that this load moves across the mesh at vehicle speed. So imagine, imagine that, um, imagine a pavement section and imagine the trailer. And what we're trying to do in the simulation is putting the, Putting the, the vehicle that we're planning on moving in January 6, 2019, I know it's past, but I'm talking like, you know, when we did the simulation, uh, putting this vehicle on this pavement and doing the actual move as if it's the real thing that's happening. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, and here's a little animation here that I'm going to play. And I will pause before talking. What happened here is um, we want this to be in a steady state. So the model is run until the vehicle has reached its steady state. Load gradually increases from the start of the pavement and moves through the pavement length. And this is done to minimize, now you can see how it's reached its steady state. This is done to minimize the dynamic effects and achieve a steady state basin shape beneath the rolling trailer. Um, we're still talking about the model, so displacement, um, vertical displacement. Um, in this graph, you're seeing displacement versus the location of um, the, first, the, the axle. Um, so zero is the location of first axle, and the displacement was measured along the center line of the roadway to produce this basin curve. Um, if you think about the pavement structure, pavement cross section, uh, when the vehicle is moving, maximum displacement occurred right at the first axle. And then the oscillation is consistent for all the axles until the end. Uh, maximum displacement that we saw was 1.4 millimeters, which is 55 mils. Peak, um, so we're talking about, uh, now we'll talk about asphalt strain. So that was all of the models. Um, peak, um, the peak tensile strains were found on top surface. So maximum concentration of strains um, is happening at the beginning of the asphalt. So when we did the analysis, uh, we were assuming that that would happen um, around the in the around the middle of the asphalt. But we were uh, we were caught by surprise when we found that the concentration of strain was actually at the beginning of the asphalt. Um, and the maximum tensile strains are found near the top surface between the tire pairs, so this one right here. Um, and then if you look at the axle line, this is the tires on the axle line. And if you look at the axle line itself, though, uh, the maximum tensile strains were found between the inner tire pairs. So this is the inner tire pair. This is the section views of the asphalt, and I'm showing compressive stresses and tensile strain at the same time. Um, what's happening here is this is the, the tire load, right? Um, and compressive stresses below the tires lead to the lateral expansion of asphalt out, outward. Um, so what's happening is asphalt between the tires is then squeezed, is then squeezed down here. Um, from both sides and expands vertically upwards, which is where, where it is not confined. So 
um, this is also called Poisson's effect. So, for example, when we when you squeeze something together, it wants to squeeze out the other way. Um, this is the same phenomenon that causes top-down cracking or rutting in asphalt pavement. This graph here is um, maximum principal strain versus um, the location of the axle again. It might seem like graph before, but um, it's a different graph. Um, what it is showing you is that you have um, significant strains due to the curvature as the vehicle moves down the road. Oh, sorry, I clicked on it. Um, as the vehicle moves down the road. Um, you know why? Because the speed changes and location changes. Uh, what you're saying here is the tensile strains are lowest for the outer axle and then largest near the center, um, around the center of the axle. Peak tensile strain that uh, we were we 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 came across is 27 microstrains, uh, which is around here in um, axle 21, 20 ish. Um, and this, what is this 27 microstrain? If you remember my discussion earlier in literature review, um, our fatigue endurance limit was 70 microstrain. So we're still well below um, 70 micro strain, which means um, you know our, our AC is still in the the the, the elastic zone. Subgrade strain. Um, this is a frozen subgrade strain um, graphic, and that's unfrozen subgrade strain graphic. So remember, frozen was 1.5 meter, unfrozen was. 10 meter below that. That's how much we modeled. Um, the subgrade, what happens in subgrade strain? Well, we're, we're expecting that the whole thing will deflect with the entire load. And we have highest compressive strain in the subgrade up here on the top surface below each tire location. Um, and maximum strains up here on top surface of the respective subgrade um, layers near the center of the base. So right here, I'm right here. Um, the result of um, the subgrade strains were 21 microstrain for frozen subgrade and 170 microstrain for unfrozen subgrade. Um, and based on our NCAT limit, vertical strain limit, 200 microstrain, um, you know, we were still well under um, the 200 microstrain limit, so we were okay. Um, this is just the same slide that I brought here from literature review, just to remind everyone about the 70 microstrain and 200 microstrain. Um, fatigue damage is 70 and rubbing damage is 200. That's what we're hoping for. Now, the results um, overview, when I said earlier about multiple iterations, so multiple iterations had many things changed in the model. But we had two iterations that had everything the same other than the speed variable. Speed was the only variable that was that changed. So we had we had simulations with five kilometer per hour, three miles per hour, and uh, 15 kilometer per hour, which is nine miles per hour rolling speed. Um, so 10,000 strain, strain for 15 kilometer per hour is 24 micro strain. And five is 27, which is not a lot of difference, but that's okay. Um, and just so everyone know, like we did so many of these analysis, and we we tried to look at the relationship of you know, is there any difference in uh, when the load, load changes? Is there any difference when the tires um, load changes with the speed? There is no a uh, correlation. It's just um, it, 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 it's hard to predict, um, in other words. Um, compressive strain for these two were 160 and 170. Um, and again, we're all within the limits that we're shooting for. Now, this is the example of a different scenario that I brought in because, you know, on this slide, you're all seeing, oh, all of the, all of the strains were within the limit, no problem you know, there were nothing that we, we needed to do, right? Um, but 
for um, a different scenario, we had, this is in 2016, so we had one scenario where um, the gross faithful weight of this load was 1.3 million pounds, and another one was 3.3 million pounds, which is very close to what we just discussed about Twitter. Uh, load per tire um, is uh, 28, 46 pounds and 37, 95 pounds. So what happened um, here? Um, you know, in spring, what's the difference? What's the variable? Our base modulus is low. Subgrade modulus is very, very low. Um, and for winter, base modulus is very high. Subgrade modulus is it's frozen, right? Subbase and subgrade winter is frozen. So the difference in pen size chain was 37 and 21. I'm not trying to compare these two moves because they are completely different moves. What I'm trying to show you here is the next one, compressive strain here. So the compressive strain for spring move was 347 microstrain, which is well above 200 microstrain vertical limit that we have. And what did we do with this? Well, when we, when we did the analysis of how much of a service life it was losing, we, we um, simulated that every single time this load moved on this pavement, it was losing 2% of the service life, which means if this load was permitted to move on this pavement in spring 50 times, then we, we are at the end of the service life for this pavement. So ultimately, um, our transportation denied this move in spring, and then we did further analysis for summer move. Um, because, well, another, another thing that they could have done is wait until winter when it's frozen, because there was no, no chance of it to fail in winter, uh, but they had to move it earlier. So we did analysis for some summer move. And uh, for summer move, we, you know, the, the variables where base modulus changed by a little bit, subgrade modulus changed a lot, 15 to 45. Um, you know, not much difference in pen size screen. It's, it's higher because of the higher temperature. Um, and the compressive strain was much lower now. The, what happens in spring? Um, there is water underneath the pavement, right? So when you're trying to walk in water, what happens? You fall. So there is high chances of rutting in, sub, in spring than um, in summer. And then they finally moved in summer. We also completed shear failure analysis um, for the splitter. So now I'm back on to our previous um, splitter discussions. I, I have moved on from the, the, the small variable in the middle. Um, so shear failure analysis were completed for splitter. Um, we did localized shear failure analysis where, um, where we examined the likelihood of onset of failure in the subgrade layers. Uh, for this one, factor of safety for both Frozen and unfrozen subgrade conditions were greater than one. Um, and we also completed ultimate shear failure analysis, where we examined the likelihood of instantaneous failure of the pavement layers. Uh, factor of safety was greater than three. Um, a great story to tell you guys about this ultimate shear failure analysis, what happened. I was, I was in Edmonton um, on January 3rd of 2019, so that's three days before the move. Uh, what happened was the frost depth in Alberta had gone down to one meter, and it was no longer 1.5 meter that we had um, we had estimated. So, um, you know, everybody's panicking because all of our approvals are based on 1.5 meter. Um, this is a billion dollar industry, which, you know, if you don't move, then you're going to lose so much money. And there is so much pressure, there's political pressure, there is there is ton of pressure from everybody. Um, so my friend Hadi from um, Champaign in our ARA office, he was the one who did their failure analysis for us. Um, and him and I were on a phone call all day on the third and the fourth. I went there to do pre-move inspections and I'm going to tell you, I couldn't get anything done because this was such a, um, important issue that we had to deal with. So, um, Hadi ended up running instantaneous failure analysis uh, for for the new frost depth. 
Um, we didn't run the simulation because simulation takes about four to six weeks to run because we're not doing static simulation. If it was static, it would be done in one day. But because it's so it's a dynamic simulation, it takes a long time to run. And we didn't have six weeks, we had six hours to make the decision. So how do you run these instantaneous failure analysis? And um, you know, everybody, all the all the brains were involved and we finally gave it a go and they we we said, Okay, you guys are good to go, you can move. And then we moved. And thankfully, everything went okay, and everything went according to plan. Um, and vehicle moved um, in about six days. It completed its um, its travel from Northwest Edmonton to um, to Fort Saskatchewan. So, like I said, uh, I was there to do pre-condition inspections, which I did complete after the big uh, panic. Um, on January 6th, the splitter made its um, made its journey towards its destination. Um, so I'm going to talk about pre and post move inspections that uh, we completed, um, and it's not just for splitter. Splitter was the heaviest move that was going to um, that was going to move to Alberta Road. But around the same time, in January 24th and March 3rd, there were other two big uh, big um, parts that were being transported, stripper and depropanizer, which were um, 1.3 million kilograms and 581,000 um, kilograms in weight. Um, so we, we, all of the pre-move and post-move condition inspections were for these, all of these three heavy loads. Um, now, this is the figure that we've been talking about. Um, this is the one that has 3.5 million pound load, 26 axle lines. Uh, weight per tire was about 3,700 pounds. This is a stripper, um, 2.9 million pound load. Um, and there is a steering axle and driving axle, and both of them are not the same, um, same axle lines. You know, they are different. Um, the tires in them are different. Um, this is this is 3,700 pound um, pound per tire. The load in this this axle, and um, this axle has 3,200 pound um, load in the tires, which which you can imagine because these have more longer axles, more axles than the the front axle. This is the propanizer. Um, and this guy also has the same similar situation, 1.3 million pound load. Um, and driving axle um, has um, driving axle has uh, 1371 kg, so 3,000 pounds. And this one has um, 3,500 pounds uh, load in the tire. So they are fairly, um, fairly, you know, heavy, heavy, um, super heavy loads. Now, we completed the post and pre and post move inspections in accordance with Alberta Transportation Manual. Uh, we did both windshield survey and we did the detailed visual survey for about 30 representative pavement sections out there. Um, our primary focus was wheel track, wheel track rutting, um, cracking, um, and transverse cracking. Uh, longitudinal wheel path cracking and fatigue cracking. Uh, what you're seeing here is the turning movement of the splitter, so heaviest ever move in Alberta Road. So this is just when it had come out of uh, Darko Industries in Northwest Edmonton. So I am more interested in in this in, in this turn here. So this would be one of my representative sections when I am looking at my pre and post move. So when I went pre, I went and oh, sorry, I went and I um, I inspected this section right here. So we looked at you know any damages that um, that this vehicle might have um, might have caused to the pavement um, due to the turn. You know, as you all know, the slower the speed, the larger the damage in the pavement. The speed of these 
heavy load mills are much lower, um, you know, it, than it would be for any other vehicles. The damage to the pavement structure that they cause at three miles per hour is much more than the damage we see at 80 miles per hour due to the rate of loading. Finally, um, there were no catastrophic failure predicted based on uh, bearing capacity analysis, um, and we no fatigue, cracking, and rutting were predicted based on uh, finite element modeling analysis and based on post move inspections. No obvious um, accumulative damages were seen as compared to pre move inspections. Now I have. Uh, Short video of the moon here. With that, um, thank you for listening to my presentation, and um, I will turn the mic back to Jerry. Well, thank you. That's pretty exciting. You know, videos like that are what make uh, young kids become scientists and engineers. So pretty exciting. Thank you, Sheila, uh, for uh, a great presentation. Uh, we do have a number of questions that I'll get to in a few minutes here, but if you haven't already, we welcome you submitting your questions. If we don't get to them in the allocated time, Sheila will get back to you uh, via email. So I'd like to uh, share with you some upcoming webinars. Uh, the web uh, registration address is shown here. On November 18th, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we'll have a presentation on airport pavement management by Brian Aho, who's uh, in our uh, Madison, Wisconsin office on December the 16th, again, shifting gears again, coming from ARA's environment and health solutions business sector. Brian, another Brian, will be presenting Mask and COVID-19, a practical perspective. Uh, next slide, please. To get into uh, Q&A period here, we've got a few questions. We've been a bit long today, so we'll, we'll cover as many of these as we can. So uh, the first question really concerns this range of uh, definition of heavy load that you shared. It, it's obviously not the same across the U.S. nor in Canada. Uh, is this really the universal case of diversity, and, and why are they not the same by definition? Um, that's a very good question, Jerry. I'm going to actually go back to my literature review slide in here to talk about that. Um, so here. Um, you know, back in 1986, um, Roads and Transportation Association of Canada, which is now uh, TAC, Transportation Association of Canada, did a study across across Canada to unify vehicle weights and dimensions um, across Canada. And if you went um, into Canada and looked at the liable loads that you could have in Canada, they are different in Western Canada versus Eastern Canada. Um, there is an understanding between different DOTs that, you know, we need to have something similar, but, but each province is different. And it's the same case in U.S. Um, what you're seeing here, this, this graphic is for U.S. There is a huge amount of uh, pressure on the on the U.S. itself to standardize this um, this across all of the states. 
um, like Western states in Washington, Oregon, California, all have separate agreements and, um, you know, for weights and loads because they move um, these goods up and down. Um, East Coast is different, Michigan is different, Southern states are different. Um, so what they want to do is, um, in U.S., they want to standardize it all, you know, North and all of North America, really, like U.S., Canada, they all have the same goal across all the state, states and provinces. Um, the problem is, though, one state might allow 5% more extra loads than the other state, um, and then it is going to impact the pavements that were not designed for that load. For example, if, um, if the truck goes to Michigan with its legal load limit, um, which is uh, over 164,000 um, 164, pounds, um, it won't impact their pavement because they were designed to sustain those loads. But if you allow the same truck to go to Maine, whose legal limit is 130 in the lim in the in the order of 134,000 uh, pounds, then if you're going there without offloading your axles, then the pavement will be ripped apart um, because this pavement was never designed to handle this load. So there are standards um, on what super heavy is, but it is just different all over across um, U.S. and Canada. Okay, very complete answer. I'm going to try and get two more questions in if we can. Um, currently, what's the most common method that's used by transportation agencies to evaluate super heavy loads, the grant permits, and requirements? Um, the most common that many people probably have a good idea is um, AFTO 93, where, you know, you would collect pavement structure and then load deflection data, you evaluate the number of ethos to failure um, before the application of load, all these simple things that we do uh, for for uh, for the smaller vehicles. Um, and then, you know, we do the same thing for, uh, for after the application of load, calculate the decrease in ethos to failure. Um, the problem with this, though, is using the truck factors that were developed for loads that never exceeded 18,000 pounds per axle. And at that time, these were developed for these small loads. And for a load that's as heavy as what we've discussed today, 2.5 million pounds, this methodology simply doesn't work. And yet, people are still using it. So I. I wanted to bring this um, this attention here. Like you, we need to know what we're doing. Um, another method you could use is MEPDD, like I discussed in um, in my slide right here. Finite uh, labor. You know, we talked about uh, payment ME, right? We talked about payment ME. Um, you know, this payment ME is calibrated for heavy load, but they are not calibrated for as heavy as load that we talked about today, super heavy loads, 3.5 million pounds loads. The vehicles that are calibrated um, are the vehicles that are actually legally on the road in United States and Canada from LCPP program. There is no reason to expect that this result that we get from MECDC by analyzing um, will, be, will be logical for super heavy loads. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, there is one methodology uh, for now, which is finite element methodology, and that is our last hour of discussion on how it should be done. Um, this will actually simulate the moving load in a representative pavement section of the route. So you're actually getting the results you want for um, the, the load that's actually moving in the pavement. Okay, thank you. We're running a bit short on time, so I have a number of other questions that we've received, but you'll have to answer them via email. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I have to skip this. Yeah, mm -hmm. slide 43. Yeah. Okay. So. Thanks again, everybody, for joining today's program. And uh, just a few reminders, today's presentation, as all of our uh, webinar presentations, is recorded. And there'll be a link that'll be made available on the ARA Webinar Wednesday website. you see that link in a few days. 
Uh, we also grant PPH certificates to all participants verified by your attendance report as being on the webinar for the entire hour just to be in accordance with the requirements of the respective professional engineering boards. A copy of today's presentation, a PDF version of that file, will also be included. And please allow us uh, about two weeks to receive your certificate. And finally, one more slide. Uh, ARA is uh, a great company to work for. I'm on my third career here, um, bumping up against my seventh year anniversary. And we're always looking for great people to join our team. We've got approximately close to 50 offices in the U.S. and Canada. We strive to hire the best colleagues who like to work for fun and science and for profitability, of course. So if you're interested in our current employment opportunities, uh, please look at the uh, www.joinara at ara.com. And I want to thank you all again and have a blessed day. Thanks, Sheila, again. Great presentation. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.